today is our first advanced Java meetup. Thanks for coming. It's really great that not all 200 people came because we will be in real trouble. Uh, how many people know here what is Java? Raise your hand. Nice, nice. So you probably, most of you have read the Reactive Systems Manifesto. Yeah. So basically, reactive systems have been created in response to changes in the requirements to the event-driven systems and, uh, well, developments in the hardware. So basically, if you have like tens or hundreds of machines, or you need to respond to events uh, in milliseconds, or let's say you want to have no downtimes, or your data volumes grow from like gigabytes to terabytes, you should consider doing reactive programming style. If none of this applies to you, please don't use it. It will make your hard life miserable. So if you don't have many machines, if your response time is in seconds, uh, you, may, you can do maintenance during the night and you have gigabytes of data, don't use reactive programming. Um, so reactive systems, uh, as you probably know, are event-driven, scalable, resilient, and responsive. So they react to events, react to load, react to failures, and react to users. So these are just basic definitions. We will cover the definitions now. So event-driven. So let's say traditionally event-driven systems have been written so that you have multiple threads, maybe running on multiple machines. And if the threads need to communicate with each other, they would use some kind of shared mutable state. So maybe it's some kind of synchronized block in Java. Maybe it's actually a database where you modify data via transactions. And uh, well, it definitely works to a certain extent, but uh, it gets harder when your system get, grows larger or like if you want to I know, scale it and so on. And so the idea is to basically create lots of independent event handlers who exchange messages asynchronously and try to know about each other as little as possible. And uh, well, basically state of each event handler is encapsulated within that event handler. And it has many advantages, which we'll talk about later. Uh, yeah, so next slide. React systems are scalable. So scalable basically means that when your load goes up or down, you need to be able to process it well, well let's say efficiently used resources. So maybe you add machines, you remove machines, and it, again, really helps when your shared state uh, is not, uh, well, shared, the mutable state. This way you can move components around from one machine to another in an easy and transparent way. So again, basically I'm advocating functional programming. So the less mutable variables you have, the better. And uh, it also really helps to have uh, location transparency. So uh, the less you know about the subsystems to which you send your messages, where they are, what they do exactly, the better. This way they can be migrated from one machine to another and so on. And resiliency, so basically your system should be resilient to hardware, network, and software failures. And again, what really helps is when your subcomponents are loosely coupled, so each of them can be functioning independently. They communicate asynchronously, so if one component dies, it doesn't bring the whole system down. And again, it really helps if each component has its own small guarded state. And if one component messes up its state, well, the other components continue to work. And uh, another very interesting idea is uh, supervisor hierarchies. So it's really nice to have a hierarchy of components and subcomponents in a way that uh, a child component is monitored by a parent component. And this way, uh, if a child component fails, the parent component finds out about that and it can decide whether to restart a child or maybe it will escalate error up to its parent. And this way, uh, well, let's say errors in subcomponents can be handled in the systematic way and well, hopefully your system will be more resilient. And finally, responsive. So your system should, uh, well, let's say fulfill the business requirements of responding to user requests via user interface or application requests using, well, APIs. And it should happen under varying load conditions and in the presence of failures of subcomponents or hardware. 
So despite all the nirvana promised by reactive systems, you will still have to think about things like system design, uh, consistency guarantees, and back pressure. So this was very basic definitions. For whom of you this was very familiar? Yeah, well, cool. Uh, do you have any questions so far or comments? Cool. Uh, sorry, back pressure is not a familiar term. Uh, so basically it means that if you have a chain of components and one component is overloaded, it will tell the previous components in the pipeline to start sending messages slower. So, well, that's the idea. Any more questions? Okay. So, ACA framework. So, there are many different ways to do reactive systems. Maybe somebody wants to, do, to use Node.js. I don't really don't know much about it. But one of the frameworks is ACA. It's a Java-based framework. And it runs on JVM. It works with Java. It's also very convenient to use with Scala. And it has been ported to .NET. So, hopefully, it will be useful to you. And um, so here is a list of components of uh, ACA. It's really like the main component here is ACA actors. So actor is basically a small object, Java object, with a bit of magic sprinkled on top of it so that they can communicate with each other and form supervision hierarchies. Uh, Krista will tell you everything you need to know about ACA actors in, well, 15 minutes. And the rest of the components are built on top of uh, ACA actors. So we will have a second presentation today by Alexander Irbe, who will tell us about ACA persistence. So the idea is really that um, we want to persist the state of the actors across the restarts of the system, system failures, and so on. But at the same time, we want to do it in a scalable way. And this way, uh, things like event sourcing pattern and command query responsibility segregation is, well, one way how ACA persistence supports this process. Um, ACA streams. So ACA streams is a bit different approach. They uh, do use actors to implement it, but they don't actually use uh, or expose actors very much to you. So what you operate with is streams of events. And then you have a bunch of functions which allow you to combine and, uh, well, modify the streams. So like map, filter, join, aggregate, and so on. And I think it's called functional reactive programming. It's a very cool topic, and they actually have a back pressure implemented there, something called push-pull. I think it could be a nice presentation of its own. Maybe somebody wants to present some other time. We will not talk about it today. Um, then there is ACA remoting. Acker remoting is a way to run actors on multiple machine, machines and uh, make them communicate with each other in a way which is, uh, let's say, the way actors communicate within one JVM, it almost is the same as they communicate across multiple JVMs. So it's very easy to start a child actor on a different machine and then you can just exchange the messages. Of course, like there are some well details you have to think about because network can drop messages and so on. But at least at some level, it's like the approach is very similar. And uh, ACA cluster is basically a way how to create a group of uh, related JVMs with shared understanding who is the cluster members, who is up, who is down, who is the cluster leader, who is cluster singleton, uh, shards of different events, uh, entities, and so on. Again, we will not talk about it today, but it's an interesting topic. And it builds on ACA remoting. Um, so there are a couple of libraries for building protocol handlers. Uh, ACA IO is basically a way to build TCP protocol handlers in a convenient way, and ACA HTTP is the same thing for, well, HTTP. And as you probably know, uh, testing uh, event-driven system is a very painful activity, and concurrent systems. And so the way ACA, tests, uh, ACA solves it is that there is a very thorough framework for testing actors and actor systems. And they advocate a pattern called, well, essentially it's unit testing, but they call it onion testing. So you first take your smallest actors and you test them separately. What you do is you send them some messages and they tell them to respond to these messages with new messages, but they don't send it to the real system, but to some kind of proxy or a, a stub or I think 
uh, the word is case mirror, a probe, yeah. So in this way you can send a message and then look at the probe if the message has arrived. In this way you can test each small actor separately, then you wire them up together in a bit larger actor subsystem, you test it again it's the same way and then, well, you know, up until you get the whole application and you can do integration testing. And they even support uh, being able to run multiple JVMs and test, well, multiple JVM deployments this way. So uh, I wouldn't say that with that framework testing accuracy is that easy, but it's palatable. So, and it's hard in any case. So any questions about uh, ACA so far? Uh, you did mention the final state machines. Uh, yeah, that's true. There are lots of th small things there and here. So in ACA actors, yeah, there are finite state machines. Which is basically a way to model, uh, let's say, you can have an actor with multiple states, and in each state, the way it responds to messages is different. And this way, uh, well, if your problem which you're working with, uh, well, is suitable for such approach, well, you can model it as a finite state machine which has different behaviors in different states. So yeah, if you open ACA reference manual, it's very long and like we will not cover everything. But it's also a useful concept, I agree. And it also is present in uh, ACA persistence. So you can actually persist finished state machines if you really want to. Any more questions? Did anybody understand anything? Okay, three people, nice. You still follow my jokes, that's good. Um, so we will not scare you today with Scala almost at all. Uh, so we will have Scala examples, but really it's like, let's say 5% of Scala and it's like basically Java with pretty syntax. So what you should know is actually Scala is a language designed by Marcy Noderski, who is the guy who developed Java generics for Java version 1.5, I think. And then he kind of got bored with all this sound development process, and so he decided to make Scala. So that's his idea how the Java should have been done. So he did pizza, then he did uh, Java generics, and then he did Scala. And uh, yeah, so today we'll just look at things which have almost direct uh, analogs in Java. So it's just Java with pretty syntax. And actually, it's a kind of a gateway drug. So you start programming in a very Java object-oriented style, and then slowly you kind of move towards having less mutable variables and more final values which cannot be modified. And uh, once you reach enlightenment, um, what will happen is that if the program compiles, very often it actually is correct, which is a nice thing. Like, I'm not saying it's, it will always be like that, but there is certain bias. Well, just my opinion. Um, yeah, so here is this Java with pretty syntax. This is a class. Here is the syntax for mutable variables and immutable vari values. So, um, well, basically, I just wrote the Java syntax here. I haven't used Java for a long time. I hope it's right. Uh, what I don't like about Scala is that the difference between mutable and immutable va variable is only one letter. And it's a very similar letter, so sometimes you don't notice it, but yeah. If it's R in the end, it's immutable, and if it's vowel, it's, uh, it's a mutable thing. Well, hopefully it's easy to read. Um, another example here, you have a class with a method called fun1. It has two parameters, A and B, with the integer type, and it returns a Boolean. And you actually can program in a style which is almost like identical to Java, you can write if statements and you can have return statements. But actually, uh, return statements are not very welcome in Scala. You can do them, but well, let's say probably very pure functional programmers would say that return statement is like a go-to statement. And kind of the go-to statement by now is not very welcome by people. So instead, what you should do is you should write expressions where, well, each branch tells you what to return, basically. So you cannot, you cannot escape from your control inside of the function. So I don't want to bother you too much with this thought, and I will not use this insight in this presentation anyway, but just think about it. Returns are bad. 
Um, and also, well, in Scala at least, if you do use returns, you will have to specify the return type. If you don't use uh, the return statements, actually your return type will be inferred by the compiler. And you can actually skip lots of types in uh, type annotations in Scala because locally the compiler will just infer them for you. Some say that Scala is modern C++ and when it doesn't compile you will get five pages of errors, but you, well, you learn how to deal with it. Um, any questions? So here's another example, uh, really again very basic syntax. I assume most of you do know what a lambda expression is, right? It's now in Java 8. It's basically the same syntax, but you have a minus here instead of, uh, well, equality. But it's basically an anonymous function, right? How many of you have used lambda expressions? Good. Um, yeah, so we have this uh, method which takes a list which is uh, parameterized by string. So I think in Java it's a different bracket, but basically it's just a generic list. And this function basically uh, takes a list and maps each element by applying to it this function which computes the length of the element, uh, the length of the string, and the result is basically a list of integers. As you can see, the type is actually not present here because it's inferred. Any questions? Good, very boring stuff. And the only interesting stuff is actually case classes. Um, so case classes is basically lots of lots of, let's say just Scala generated code or compiler generated code which makes your life easier. Um, if you look at this animal thing, it's basically it's a Java bean and uh, legs is a property. And what Scala compiler does for you is generates getters, setters, hash code, equals and some other magic methods which you need for your work. And it's just very convenient to program with and uh, yeah, so it has some theoretical underpinnings, ab abstract data types in Haskell, but yeah, it's very important for ACO because most messages are actually case classes. And the most important thing is that uh, you can do pattern matching on uh, case classes. The way it works is that, uh, so we have a thing which is a living, by the way living is a trait which is basically Java interface. Uh, the only thing different is that trade can have default implementations of methods. And I think actually now Java 8 also has default implementations of methods. It's just that we had them a long time ago. Um, and basically match statement is uh, a very advanced switch statement. And uh, you have just case expressions which says that if we have an animal with two legs, let's talk to this thing. Or if it's a plant, and we want to match, this edible will be a new variable or value which is bound to the value of this property, and then we can do if. So if it's edible, then let's eat the thing. And there is a default branch which, well, will match anything. So the reason I'm showing it to you is because uh, usually the inner loop of all actors is this, uh, some kind of uh, matching expression. So you receive some messages, you match on them, and then you send out new messages. So it's important to read this code. Yeah, um, any questions? Uh, did anybody understand anything? One person, nice. Uh, so we are done with all the boring and introductory stuff. Now everybody knows everything and it's now to listen to the real man. Uh, a final slide about obligatory cute animal picture. It's the first time I do it and uh, it's our coworker's dog, and he decided to call it Scala. And that's pretty much it. Any comments, suggestions, questions? Any new Scala converts? Not yet, not yet, I see. We have to work on it. 